And the, the, one of the, the sources which I'm going to quote um, is actually a Trinitarian himself. Many of the ideas which I'm going to be bringing tonight, and there's a couple of quotes which I also want to bring, come from a scholar called James D.G. Dunn. Dunn is D-U-N-N. Now, he's a very eminent um, professor here in England. He's, he's well known in the States as well. Um, American scholars quote him quite frequently. And he's the professor of divinity at the University of Durham, which is, is quite a prestigious university. And um, he's written a book called Christology in the Making, which is where some of these ideas which I'm going to be sharing with you tonight have come from. And that really is a recommended reading for all the listeners. And the reason why I've chosen to, to quote him as a Trinitarian it is firstly because he obviously has no axe to grind. If, if anything, his perspective on Philippians 2 should be seeking to reinforce the idea of a pre-existent Jesus who is God and then becomes a man. Be because that is the creed which he has signed up to. And I think we also need to be aware of the fact that many of these people who are in positions of, of ministry or sitting on the faculty in a, in a theological department have a vested interest in not rocking the boat, in not challenging the status quo. So very often... Uh, even if they don't entirely subscribe to a particular viewpoint, they, they may choose to remain quiet on it because their career could be at stake. I think that's something we, we should always remember. Yes. When we look at people like professional pastors, professional ministers, professional theologians, we sometimes have them on a pedestal and look at them as being experts to the extent that we don't evaluate their message in the light of the scriptures. Now, I'm saying there's a lot we can learn from them, especially if they're skilled in languages, they have an understanding of the, the cultural background and the history of various texts, which can really help with the exegesis, with, with breaking down what those texts are about. But at the same time, we, we should never forget the fact that if you're earning your living as a Trinitarian minister, or as a minister who preaches that souls go to heaven when they die, when they die then you, you've got a vested interest in, in promoting that doctrine. And you might not even be as objective or as neutral in your approach as somebody who isn't making a living from propounding these beliefs. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so this man, James Dunn, um, has every reason to bring forth a Trinitarian interpretation of the, te the text, but he doesn't. So that's the first reason I've chosen him, so that no one can accuse him of being biased in favor of the Abrahamic faith or a monotheistic interpretation of Philippians 2. And there's another reason as well. And that is because he is a foremost scholar, and the reason for him being a foremost scholar is that he has studied the material of the Bible very thoroughly, and not just the Bible, but the intertestamental period. The intertestamental period is the period between the Old and New Testaments. The period between Malachi's message, the prophet Malachi, and John the Baptist. And um, what that does is, by, by studying that material, although we don't recognize it as being inspired by God and having the same authority as the, the texts which make up the Bible, we do understand that it gives very valuable insight into recovering the mindset and the atmosphere which the people to whom the Gospels and the Epistles were first addressed, the kind of, the atmosphere they lived in and the way that they would have understand, understood these writings. So he, he does a very good job of reconstructing the mindset of the people who have read Philippians and how they would have heard it, as opposed to how we, after the Council of Nicaea, after the Council of Chalcedon, after the, 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 the long, drawn-out battle which took hundreds of years and through which the Trinity Doctrine was formulated, we look back through that history to the text. What, what Dunn is trying to do is reconstruct the mind of somebody who hasn't lived through that history and he's hearing it fresh. Yeah. And, and really, a faithful exegesis or breakdown of the text depends upon that. It depends upon the ability to go back to Paul's mind and to understand what he was driving at and, and not see it through the lens which we might be looking at it through. Okay. And, and so he, that's his thesis. The best way to understand the New Testament writers is by looking at their writings from the standpoint of their contemporaries. Now, what he suggests is that there was a, a very different background um, in the mind of the readers who read Philippians at the time that it was written, to what there is today. He has painstakingly gone through the New Testament, and he's gone through the documents in the order in which they were written. 
And he says at the time when Philippians was written, there was no concept in the Christian community of, of this story of, of God the Son becoming a man. Right. The early Christians did not believe in that. They, they, they did not believe that. Right. And James Dunn himself, with all of his research into the intertestamental literature, the, 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 the texts of the New Testament, he said you can find no trace of this belief. It was just alien to them. And, and so God the Son as a term hadn't been coined yet. And so the idea of Jesus existing as a person before he was born, then becoming a man, they, they wouldn't have approached it with that, that pre-understanding. And so it's very unlikely that they would have read it out of the text, since it doesn't specifically say that. So that's the first point I'd like to make. I mean, in actual fact, he, he, he sets up a, 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 um, an alternative interpretation in page 114 of Christology in the Making. He says that what, is, what works much better is the Adam Christology, which was widely current in the Christianity of the 40s and 50s. It seems to me, he writes, that Philippians 2, 6 to 11 is best understood as an expression of Adam Christology and one of the fullest expressions that we still possessed. And earlier on in the book, he's explained how widespread the Adam Christology was. Now, shall I just say a quick word about the Adam Christology? Okay, yes, please. Well, um, in a previous conversation, we, we explored the um, understanding of Jesus in terms of his, him being the prophet like Moses, right. that the priest after the order of Melchizedek, and the, 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 the Davidic king, didn't we? Yes. Well, another way in which um, the New Testament writers set out to explain Jesus was in terms of a comparison between him and Adam. And that comparison worked in two ways, because you could look at who Adam was created to be, and you could gain some sense of that the stature of Jesus, the, the exalted nature of Jesus being created as this, this innocent man, this, this new creation of God. Remember, Adam had no human parents. He, he was a, described by Luke in the genealogy as being a, a son of God, and in the same way Jesus, having a human mother, but, but God as his father, was, was something of a new creation, wasn't he? Yes. But Adam also works as the paradigm for what went wrong. Every one of us in our brokenness, in our fallenness, in our sinfulness, are bearing something of the image of what Adam became. And so, Adam really represents the problem. He represents the mess that we're all in. And in that way, he's very useful to provide a contrast. Because it's only sometimes in terms of the problem that you can really present the solution. That's a good point. And so, Jesus, as being the solution to man's plight... Is, is compared as, as being another Adam. An Adam who has arrived on the scene and he has come to, to mend what Adam broke. He's come to win back what Adam lost. And so th this is the Adam Christology and it's very highly prevalent as, as Dunn has says here in the 40s and 50s. Remember Jesus was crucified, um, died and rose again in, in roughly AD 30. So we're talking about w within less than a generation of, of Jesus's earthly ministry. In um, Christology in the Making, page 108, I'm just going to read you a last quote from Dunn. He says, The last Adam begins, which is Jesus, where the first Adam ended. The first Adam ends in death. That's where everyone who's in the image of the first Adam ends, isn't it? Yes. After death, really, that's it. Your, your resurrection really is only going to be to be judged, and then you're going to die again, the second death, from whence there is no resurrection. So the first Adam, at, at the end of it, he dies, and he is no more. The last Adam begins from resurrection. It is the exalted Christ who bears the image and glory that Adam lost. So from when Jesus rose again from the dead, he became the last Adam. He, he kicked off a new humanity from, from when he was begotten from the dead. So, having, having understood that background, let, let's, let's take a look at Philippians 2 again, shall we? Okay. Now that we know the background against which it would have been understood... By, by the first readers and indeed by, by the writer himself. Let's look at um, this, this description of Jesus, first of all, as being in the form of God, because it is contrasted, if we look in the following verse, verse 7, with the form of a bondservant. So there's a contrast. Form of God versus form of a bondservant. And there's another contrast. Equality with God, in verse 6, 
with the likeness of men. So you have a contrast that the form of God with the form of a bond slave and equality with God and the likeness of men. What Paul is clearly alluding to here is Genesis 1-3, to the narrative about the creation and fall of man. And that, that is what provides the perfect background, which, which integrates very well, not only with the background in the Hebrew Bible, but also with the rest of the New Testament.